Welcome back to Geographics. I'm your host, Cosmic Horror and Dark Fantasy Madman Eric Malachite, and today we're diving into a super interesting topic. Have you ever wondered what happened to the Roanoke Island colony? Well, thanks to a script written by Radu Alexander, you are about to find out. And the answer might surprise you. And if you dig storytelling, deep dives, and podcasts about media, check out my Story Rant channel. With that said, let's get started. On May 8th, 1587, three ships carrying over 100 people left England and set sail for the New World with an ambitious goal in mind, to settle the first permanent English colony in America. They landed on Roanoke Island off the coast of North Carolina, but they had a rough go of it from the beginning, and supplies dwindled quickly. Plus, the locals were, you know, not too happy with their arrival. After only a month, the leader of the expedition, John White, sailed back to England to secure more aid, leaving the colonists behind. He didn't return until three years later, and when he did, everyone was simply gone, with few clues as to their ultimate fate. Ever since then, there has been intense debate over what happened to the lost colony of Roanoke. It has been referred to as the Area 51 of colonial history, and to this day, we don't have a definitive answer. There are lots of ideas, some more plausible than others. It wasn't aliens. So today, we explore the island of Roanoke and the mystery of its missing colony. And now that we think about it, maybe it was aliens. Here at Geographics and over on our sister channels, Biographics and Top Tens, we live and breathe facts. It's incredibly exciting to learn more about the world and the people in it. We also believe it's important to learn more about who you are and where you come from. That's why we have partnered with MyHeritage, the leading global service for family history and DNA testing. Using MyHeritage, you can build your own family tree by accessing their incredible 19 billion historical records. Finding out more about your origins is exceptionally easy with their Instant Discoveries tool, which uses smart match technology to find connections between your family tree and those of 90 million other MyHeritage users. You can expand your family tree instantly and maybe even discover some new relatives in the process. I discovered a lot about my family history, in particular on my father's side, that my grandmother had just so many siblings. I also found a potential match for my mother's father and mother through the discovery tool, though I am waiting to get confirmation from the site owner for that tree before I add it. Still, it's incredible because I didn't know my mother, and it's a really sad story I won't share here. She died when I was really young. So to even have a chance to reconnect with long lost relatives is a pretty powerful thing. One amazing thing that MyHeritage can do for you is restoring old photographs. You can take a historic black and white photo of a family member like this one here and use their AI technology to repair, colorize, and even animate it. So why not take a look and discover more about who you came from? Click the link in the description or scan the QR code to sign up for a 14-day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features MyHeritage has to offer. You never know what you might learn about yourself unless you give it a try. Roanoke is a 12-mile long, 3-mile wide island in Dare County, North Carolina, sandwiched between the mainland and the barrier islands known as the Outer Banks, located south of the Albemarle Sound. Thousands of years ago, it too was part of the Carolina mainland, but sea levels rose around 400 AD and turned it into an island surrounded by brackish water. It is named after the Roanoke Native Americans, an Algonquin-speaking tribe that lived on the island and the mainland for years before the arrival of English colonizers. Just how long is hard to say, because they are an extinct tribe today. They pass down their history and heritage strictly through the oral tradition, and as you might expect, early European settlers had little interest in preserving or recording their local culture for posterity. Even before the Roanoke people, others have lived or at least visited the island for thousands of years. There is archaeological evidence that Juan Cheese, one of the main settlements on the island alongside Mantillo, has been used as a popular fishing spot by the locals ever since Roanoke turned into an island, as well as a 
rich supply of oysters and shellfish. Scholars usually divide the pre-European settlement of Roanoke Island into three components. The Mount Pleasant culture, roughly between 400 and 800 AD, the Collington culture, and finally the Carolina Algonquin culture that was there when the English arrived and included, among others, the Roanoke people. <laughs> The infamous voyage that included the Lost Colony was not actually the first one to Roanoke, but the third. Ever before that, a decade earlier, England developed a keen interest in exploring and colonizing North America, mainly out of a rivalry with the Spanish Empire. This ambitious plan was the pet project of two half-brothers, both famed statesmen and explorers, Sir Humphrey Gilbert and Sir Walter Raleigh. To that end, Queen Elizabeth I awarded Gilbert in 1578 a 60-year grant to settle unclaimed parts of North America in her name. The first expedition left later that year, captained by Gilbert himself and with Raleigh also on board. But they only reached the coast of Africa before heavy storms forced them to turn back. A new mission went out in March 1580, captained by a Portuguese navigator named Simon Fernandez, who would end up making this trip a bunch of times. He reached New England and did a bit of recon on the mid-Atlantic coast before returning home. The third and final Gilbert mission took place in 1583, once more headed by himself. This time, he reached Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, but got caught in a violent storm on the way back, and the ship he was on, the Squirrel, was lost at sea. Word of his half-brother's death did not deter Walter Raleigh, who, at the time, did not share the high status of his step-sibling, but would go on to become much more famous in the decades that followed as a favorite of Queen Elizabeth. Raleigh took up the mantle of American colonization from Gilbert and, in 1584, planned his own trip to the New World. This was the first of three missions to Roanoke Island, although we should point out that Walter Raleigh was not on board for any of them. The expedition set off from Plymouth on April 27, 1584. It was just two small ships, one commanded by Philip Amadas and the other by Arthur Barlow. It was a minor expedition because the goal was not to establish a colony, but only to scout out possible locations for future settlements. Such a location would serve as a major pain in the butt for the Spanish by hopefully acting as a base for privateering and disrupting their trade routes in the region. With that in mind, the sailors reached the outer banks of what is today North Carolina in July 1584. They found a small landmass between the outer banks and the mainland where, according to Barlow's journal, the soil is the most plentiful, sweet, fruitful, and wholesome of all the world. They made a note that this island, which would later go on to be called Roanoke, would serve as a great site for a potential colony and even came into contact with the Carolina Algonquin people. This first meeting was friendly, and the explorers even convinced two high-ranking locals to accompany them back to England. They were called Wanchis of the Roanoke people and Mantio of the Croatoan or the Croatan tribe, who lived on a nearby barrier island and were allies of the Roanoke. By the way, if those names sound familiar to you, that's because we already mentioned the two main settlements on Roanoke Island, which are named after the duo. They made quite a sensation at Queen Elizabeth's court, but Walter Raleigh was mainly interested in information about the new land he intended to settle. He assigned the task to astronomer and mathematician Thomas Harriot, who devised his own phonetic alphabet in order to decipher and learn the Carolina Algonquin language while also teaching Juan Cheese and Mantio to speak English. This expedition was just step one in Raleigh's plan to colonize America, a plan that was wholeheartedly endorsed by Queen Elizabeth, who considered it essential to stick it to the Spanish. Plus, if they happened to find some gold and silver in America and convert some heathens, that would be a nice bonus too. It was decided. The following year, a new expedition would leave England, this time with colonists, and try to settle on Roanoke Island. The mission set off on April 9th, 1585, with a fleet consisting of seven ships carrying around 600 sailors, soldiers, and colonists. Once again, Raleigh himself stayed put in England. Notable people aboard the vessel included Sir Richard Grenville, Raleigh's cousin and leader of the expedition, Ralph Lane, the governor of this new colony, Simon Fernandez, once again acting as navigator, Thomas Harriet, the scientist who would act as a translator with the locals, and Juan Cheese and Mantillo, who had had their fill of London and just wanted to go home. 
Well, one, she is probably more than Mantillo. The former was not impressed with what he saw and sneaked away from the group when they reached America to warn the native tribes to be wary of the newcomers. Mantillo, on the other hand, liked the English and remained loyal to them throughout his life, always doing his best to urge amicable relations between the colonists and the Native Americans. While on Roanoke, Mantillo was even baptized into the Church of England, the first person in the New World to do so, and was awarded the ceremonial title of Lord Roanoke by Walter Raleigh. Anyway, this second voyage did not go as smoothly as the first. For starters, one of the ships ran aground while trying to navigate the Outer Banks and lost all of its cargo. As it happened, that ship was carrying most of the food that was supposed to last the colonists a whole year. Now they only had supplies for a few weeks. This forced the English to go hat in hand to the native tribes that lived on the coast of North Carolina, a region the locals called, and I'm gonna butcher this pronunciation because I could not find a pronunciation guide, also Makomuk, and asked them for food. But they could have probably used a few more lessons in diplomacy, especially Philip Amadas, who at one point burned down the entire village of, and I'm gonna butcher this one as well because there was not a pronunciation guide that I could find, Akwaskagok, because someone supposedly stole a cup. At least, he allowed the residents to evacuate first, so that's something, I guess, but that's usually not how you want to behave towards someone you are dependent on for your survival, right? But even so, the Roanoke people, led by a chief named Wengana, were friendly to the English, and not only supplied them with food, but also allowed them to settle in the north end of Roanoke. Eventually, Grenville and most of the fleet sailed back to England, leaving behind around 100 colonists governed by Ralph Lane. Lane and Wengana didn't really like each other and their relationship only grew tenser as the months passed. Unsurprisingly, things eventually turned bloody. And on June 1st, 1586, Lane led a surprise raid on a town called Dashmankapuk, considering it a preemptive strike. Whether or not the Native Americans truly intended to attack, we cannot say, but the assault ended with one of the colonists parading around with Wengana's head in his hands. So from now on, you could describe the relationship between the two sides as frosty. The Roanoke did not retaliate immediately. Again, if they had any plans for revenge, we can't tell you because the English were saved by a large fleet led by Sir Francis Drake that just so happened to pass through the neighborhood. At that point, Ling turned back and said, screw you guys, Roanoke, I'm going home. Or something to that effect, we're not 100% sure. And he and his people abandoned the colony, boarded the ships, and returned to England. Okay, so the second attempt didn't exactly go swimmingly, and Raleigh wasn't too thrilled with Lane leaving the settlement. Furthermore, Richard Grenville had no idea that all the colonists returned to England aboard Francis Drake's ships, so he actually returned to Roanoke to bring them supplies, only to find the colony empty. Uncertain of what to do in the situation, he left behind a garrison of 15 soldiers on the island with enough food for a year and made the trip back to England as well. Raleigh was about ready to give up on his plans of colonizing America. He had already spent a large chunk of his own money to fund these expeditions with little to show for it. Plus, he was getting more interested in Ireland anyway. But Lane drew his interest with tales of exploration and finding an even better location for a settlement further up north in Chesapeake Bay, where deep water navigation was less treacherous and it would be easier to launch inland missions to search for gold and other valuables. And as a bonus, the Native Americans there didn't hate them yet. Undoubtedly, this would change once the locals got to know them a bit better. But for the time being, a colony there would be a lot safer. So Walter Raleigh said, fine, one final mission, this time not to Roanoke Island, but to Chesapeake Bay, where they would establish the city of Raleigh. The expedition left in May 1587. There were three ships, once again piloted by Simon Fernandez. We're not really sure how many colonists were aboard since the number is disputed, but it was somewhere between 112 and 121. Curiously, they decided not to take any soldiers on this trip, but they did take women and children, so clearly they had a good feeling about this one. In charge of the colonists was John White, a man who had also been on the 1585 voyage. But White was an artist. During the previous mission, he drew sketches of the landscapes and the Native Americans. What exactly made Raleigh think he was the right man for the job, we can't tell you. Maybe it was his ability to convince people to pack up their bags and sail across the Atlantic to settle a new colony in an unknown land surrounded by unfriendly locals, even though the previous mission went terribly. But that's what he did. 
White got whole families to join the expedition, including his own daughter, Eleanor Dare, who was pregnant at the time, by the way. Random historical fact for you, John White's granddaughter, Virginia Dare, was born on Roanoke Island on August 18th, 1587, making her the first English child born in the Americas. And she is the one that the modern day Dare County is named after, which also includes Roanoke Island. But anyway, the ship set sail and arrived in July. Remember, the original plan wasn't to try and colonize Roanoke again, but to go further up north. However, the colonists thought that they should stop by Roanoke Island and check on the 15 soldiers left behind by Grenville. So John White and his people disembarked at Roanoke on July 22nd, and that's when something strange happened. Because Fernandez informed them that he would not allow them to reboard, and he would not take them to Chesapeake Bay. According to White's account, Fernandez argued that the summer was too far gone and there wasn't enough time for them to wait. Then sail to Chesapeake Bay, then make it back home. It was a flimsy explanation, and the truth was that Fernandez probably wanted enough time to squeeze in some plundering of Spanish ships in the West Indies. That's what sailors really cared about, not colonizing. Any trip without booty was a trip wasted, as far as they were concerned. The other strange part about this whole thing was that White didn't argue at all. He just said, yeah, fine, we'll stay on Roanoke Island, making some scholars believe that he knew about this the whole time, although White still made sure to place all of the blame on Fernandez in his own account. So the English colonists were on Roanoke again, but the soldiers weren't. White found the garrison completely abandoned, and the houses overgrown and quite disturbingly, the only sign of the previous occupants were the bones of one of those 15 soldiers who had been killed months earlier. Not exactly an encouraging sign, and things got significantly worse just six days later when the body of one of the new colonists, George Howe, was found in the woods a few miles from camp doing his best porcupine impersonation with 16 arrows stuck in him. A few days later, White worked up the courage to investigate. He and a few others got in a boat and sailed south to meet with the Croatans. They were Mantio's people, and were still friendly toward the English, and they basically confirmed what everyone already suspected. The Roanokes killed the soldiers and George Howe as revenge for their chieftain's death during Ralph Lane's attack, and it was highly likely that they would attack again. With their backs against the wall, the English colonists decided to launch a preemptive strike, because that worked out so well the last time. On August 9th, just after midnight, they attacked the nearby town of Dashmankapuk, only to discover that they screwed up again. The Roanoke had abandoned that settlement and the Croatans had moved in. The colonists had just attacked their only allies in the region and although the Croatans didn't become enemies, the relationship between the two sides was definitely strained. Things weren't exactly going well, but one small glimmer of hope came in late August when Fernandez and his fleet returned. Unanimously, the colonists decided to send John White back to England to inform them of their plight and return with supplies. He left Roanoke on August 27th, 1587, not knowing that he would never see any of them again. White was back in England in November and gave Raleigh an account of what had happened. The latter was eager to send the colonists aid, but it would have to wait until after winter. By early spring, Raleigh had a large supply fleet of seven or eight ships ready to go under the command of Richard Grenville. However, the word came down from Queen Elizabeth herself. No war-capable vessels were allowed to leave English harbors. The war with Spain had intensified and King Philip II had assembled the fearsome Spanish Armada and was preparing to attack. England needed all of the ships it could find, so Roanoke would have to wait. The good news for the colonists was that Walter Raleigh was successful against the Spanish. The bad news was that he was successful against the Spanish. The Queen rewarded Raleigh with vast plantations in Ireland. He was interested in that now and didn't really care about Roanoke anymore. It was mainly John White who still fought on their behalf, but sending a supply mission across the Atlantic cost a lot of money which he didn't have, so it took him a while to gather a syndicate of investors willing to pony up the dough. It wasn't until August 18th, 1590, that White reached Roanoke again, only to find everyone gone. No signs of violence or anything like that. In fact, no signs as to what had happened at all. There were only two clues to go on. The word Croatan was carved on a post and the letters C-R-O were carved into a tree. White wanted to keep searching for the colonists, but the sailors he was with couldn't care less. They were getting ready to leave with or without him. 
So White had no choice but to board the ship and head back to England. Now onto the big question. What happened at Roanoke? Unfortunately, most of the plausible ideas all end with the same result. The colonists perished. Whether this was at the hands of the Roanoke, the Croatans, or even the Spanish, we're not sure. Alternatively, they could have been killed by a natural disaster, such as a hurricane, or maybe they were wiped out by disease or famine. But if that's what happened, where were the bodies? Where was the destruction? Why were there small boats and firearms missing? And what about the word Croatan carved into a post? These signs indicated that the colonists left willingly and took along their most useful possessions. And of course, the word in the tree suggested that they went to live among the Croatan people on Hatteras Island, which would make sense since they were the ones who hated them the least. This has been the leading hypothesis for centuries. It just has never been conclusively proven. And with a small shred of doubt still lingering in the air, the lost colony of Roanoke turned into one of the great American legends. As an aside, one wild theory is that everyone just became trees, which is weirdly terrifying to think about and sounds like it belongs in a Neil Gaiman story. And the reason some people believe this is thought to be the Croatan and CRO being carved on tree trunks and posts. And you know, there's also the conspiracy theory that they were all abducted by aliens. And yeah, there's absolutely no evidence to back that up. But hey, who needs that, right? So what happened to Roanoke Island after the failed colonization attempt? Well, not much. At least not for a while. The English had no more interest in it, and the Roanoke kept living there for another 70 years until they were completely driven away by European colonists during the Anglo-Powhatan Wars. The English soon realized that Roanoke Island wasn't particularly useful for agriculture or deep water sailing, and it also had the tendency to get struck by deadly hurricanes every now and then. Therefore, it stayed a quiet, isolated fishing community for a few hundred years, with the remnants of its turbulent origins long forgotten. However, there was an uptick in activity during the American Civil War. First, there was the Battle of Roanoke Island, a two-day affair on February 7th and 8th in 1862, when the Union Navy, commanded by General Ambrose Burnside, captured almost 2,500 Confederate soldiers who were stationed on the island. After that, Roanoke started serving as a refuge for escaped slaves looking to gain freedom in Union-controlled areas, and by 1863, the army had established the Freedmen's Colony on the northern end of Roanoke Island. Thousands of black men and women came to Roanoke in the hopes of a better life, and they got it, but only for a few years. Despite making promises of granting land rights, the government must have just plain forgot because after the Civil War, President Andrew Johnson issued an amnesty proclamation which returned all property to its previous owners before the war. So the freedmen got nothing and most of them chose to leave Roanoke, with only a few hundred staying behind. And that's about it. Nowadays, Roanoke Island is still a small and quiet community with just under 7,000 residents. However, the location of the colony was designated a National Historic Site, and it attracts plenty of tourists who remain fascinated with this bizarre and mysterious incident from the early colonial history of America. Well, I certainly hope you found this video to be entertaining and informative, and if you did, be sure to do all that algorithmic jazz and give Radu a thank you in the comments, since I believe he doesn't have any socials for you to follow yet. Remember to click the link in the description or scan the QR code to sign up for a 14-day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features MyHeritage has to offer. And be sure to give my channel StoryRant a look, and I'll see you next time, Space Cowboy.